So across time, we've heard a lot of people talk about autism. And when we have, we tend to hear about those social and those communication differences, that kind of surface level stuff, the tip of the iceberg, if you will. But often underneath that, what's in the water of that metaphorical iceberg is all these other challenges that are then impacting communication, that are then impacting social interaction, that are impacting someone's ability to understand their own emotions, to regulate themselves, to empathize with others, and pretty much everything else we commonly refer to as the autism symptoms actually are coming from something else. And if we can resolve some of those things underneath the water, then hopefully we'll see it may be slowly, it may take some time, but we can see uh, improvements in someone's ability to um, live a happier, healthy life. I mean, normally someone says function, but uh, let, let's not focus on that kind of word. Let's focus on their ability to not be distressed, uh, to be happy, to be healthy. And, and functioning should come along with that, sure. <laughs> but maybe that shouldn't be the goal here. Sometimes you might hear these sensory differences referred to as sensory processing disorder or sensory integration disorder. So often someone has to have uh, significant sensory differences. I know a very, very vague statement, as in a lot of <laughs> diagnostic criteria, um, and they often have to impact across multiple life domains. That's the point which uh, is a bit the sticking point for me, because to be honest, you know, home and school, that's multiple life domains. If they want more life domains, your child may not be able to access more life domains because they have the sensory processing differences, which is where unfortunately some people can miss that diagnostic criteria. <clears throat> so for this course, we're going to refer to sensory processing disorder as any kind of sensory difference that is really in more than one category. So rather than being a, just an oversensitivity to one particular sense, if there's multiple senses that are impacted with over or under sensitivities, then we're going to say it's sensory processing disorder. Uh, it is important to know that it is a separate diagnosis than autism. You often or won't get that diagnosis. You can, uh, in some cases, request it, and it might be added on or given as a separate diagnostic letter. And that's because a lot of people, a lot of diagnosticians, it's just the sensory things are now a part of autism. So they're seen as a part of autism, and often you might not get a separate diagnosis. But that separate diagnosis of sensory processing differences can be really useful. Because I find if you go into a school uh, and you say, my child's autistic, autism is such a huge thing, so varied, it's so you know vague, and all the associated conditions uh, and all the things that come along with it, often saying autism isn't always helpful. Like, if you're an autistic child, you know, structure, routine, that may help. If you're an autistic child with a PDA profile, that goes out the kind of window. So just saying someone's autistic, not necessarily helpful. But going in there and say sensory processing differences, oversensitive to light, instantly that gives you ideas. Okay, oversensitive to light. For the window, light be okay? What about the lights overhead? Where should we seat the child? Oh, they're undersensitive to sound at the front of the desk. You see, instantly that gives us strategies. And for teachers, you need to make it as easy as possible because they're already probably overworked, have a class size way too big. Your special education needs coordinates, your SENCO at school may have a ton of other pupils to deal with on a Wednesday afternoon, as well as being a full-time teacher, as well as having to study for that level five, edge, uh, level five qualification in, in autism. So <clears throat> Making it as easy as possible for them, giving them the strategies will hopefully mean that they get done uh, rather than your child just continuing to suffer even though their needs are known. It also means, you know, if you can identify those sensory differences, you can help build something we call a sensory profile. And um, that's, you know, that chart, let's say, of all the things that are over and under sensitive to. And when you figured that out, you're instantly going to know what they're going to find challenging in a situation um, what things can be done about that, what's keeping out, what the problems are, even what gifts they might enjoy. So that really gives that massive list of access. And when it comes to engaging with GPs, hospital appointments, colleges, any change in circumstances in the future, that sensory profile can be used to make a simple page that we sometimes call a grab sheet uh, that can be handed to those professionals, let them, lets them know, oversensitive to sound, talk quietly, oversensitive to touch, don't grab them, they'll lash out. Or undersensitive to pain, you may need to ask different questions or check thoroughly because they may not be able to tell you. You know, those simple things that those professionals need to know that are in a very easily accessible format that they will actually read. 
Also having documentation, you yourself having written down what the sensory differences are, can allow you then to make the claim that you need a sensory OT, which is a hard thing to get in the UK, lots of demand for it. Also this information could go on any educational healthcare plan, the education healthcare plan can be updated to include those sensory needs and the sensory differences and what comes as a result of that. So looking at the sensory needs can have a huge impact, addressing them a massive impact. And I, I, I can't even stress as much detail. How many patients or children do I get told of that have these physical behaviours that might be misinterpreted as aggressive when actually it's underlying sensory needs that are not met? And if we start to meet those needs in a proactive way, we can reduce those physical behaviours. And a child that was seen as challenging or even aggressive can now not be seen that way. And that child, if they're coming across as aggressive, you can bet that they were being very, very distressed by everything, even if they can't communicate it. So we're taking a huge ton of stress off that child, helping them learn better, helping them socialize, helping them engage. And that's really our end goal here to help your... So it's now known that most autistic people have some kind of sensory difference. Uh, so that may show itself as them avoiding crowds, bright lighting or intolerance of noises. You know, there's quite obvious ones, but there may be some that are less obvious, such as difficulty with temperature change. That could be seasonal. You could think, oh, it's the start of the school term. That's why they're having problems. When actually it's autumn, it's winter. You could think, uh, oh, it's... I don't know, the end of the school term they're having a problem with when actually it's it's not just that, and that lack of structure, that routine, those transitions. It could be the actual weather changes, the sun, the dryness of the air, the way the wind moves, uh, so much that goes into those seasonal changes. It could also be other things that are more internal, such as our interceptive senses, which we're going to look at. That's sleep, it's hunger, it's your bowels, it's everything going on inside that may be a little bit hidden. It's also the case that if someone's undersensitive to something, you might not ever notice. I've got people around me that are undersensitive to temperature. I wouldn't notice. I mean, perhaps you do when they're wearing shorts in the winter, but to them, that's not a problem. That, that's fine, that's normal. However, in a young child, it could be quite different. If you're, over, if you're undersensitive to temperature, for instance, you not wearing appropriate clothing can lead to damage to your body. So even though you don't feel it, it's still having an effect. Adults, a little bit different. They're more aware of maybe the subtle cues they're picked up on themselves and how they work. So they can wear those shorts in the winter. They cannot have the heating on and maybe pick up when actually they need to wear more clothing. They need to put on the heating.